Hello. Well, hi. Uh, my name is Asaf. I work for, <laughs> you can guess. Uh, we have pretty subtle templates this year. <laughs> and uh, I manage a group of engineers working on uh, OpenStack networking, uh, Neutron, Octavia, SFC, uh, and OVN. Um, and this all began with an argument. Um, and, and I wanted to win the argument, so I spent months of my time uh, <laughs> working on things that are not consequential at all. Uh, but you're a captive audience, you're here, so you have to listen. Um, and the argument was, this was a colleague in Red Hat, and he said, I have engineers and they're sending patches upstream and nobody's giving them the time of day. So the patches aren't getting merged. And what are we to do about that? And that resonated with me because we're all familiar with that because anybody working on OpenStack knows what that feels like. And that brought me back to when I was starting to work on OpenStack. And I was the first uh, developer on my team in the Israeli office working on, uh, on Neutron. And my mentor was in San Francisco. Uh, so I never spoke with him. Um, so what happened there, was that my manager told me uh, there's this bug and you gotta fix it. So I said, okay. So I was pretty new at Red Hat and I was pretty a junior at, in the industry. So uh, my world became, I, I was obsessed with fixing this bug, right? My entire world was about fixing this one bug. It was the most important thing in the world. So I uh, reproduced it and I did root cause analysis and I worked on it for days and days. And then I did design work. Should I fix it this way? Should I fix it that way? And I found the best uh, way to fix the bug. And I wrote this pristine, beautiful patch. And it was just marvelous. And I, I, I had this vision of me sending the patch to the upstream community. And I was kind of naive. I was, I was new to open source. And I had this vision of you know five, this kind of ceremony, right? So I. I donated this, you know, people use the term, the verb donate. So I, I, I donated the, the, the patch uh, and I expected all of these people to say, thank you, Asaf, wow, you fixed this important bug and the, the work that you did is so amazing. Uh, and then nobody gave a sh I mean, nobody, just nobody, <laughs> nobody. I just sent the patch and nobody, right? It's just sitting there. And, and you know, this was for firewall as a service, CLI, niche, uh, but I mean, even within firewall as a service CLI, this was like a niche thing that no, this bug was not important at all. This is the bug that you give to a new developer just, just so that they know how it all works. It didn't matter at all. Um, <clears throat> so that sucked a lot. Um, and so I, I remember what it's like. So I, I was arguing with this colleague and uh, I was like, yeah, I, I, I know what that feels like. And I really wanted to win the argument, and I thought, because uh, I'm like that, and I thought, uh, how do you win an argument? Well, you present uh, data, right? You present data because that's really hard to argue against, especially if the data is even true. Um, so I said, all right, I can do that. Uh, I have lots of spare time. Uh, just note that my manager hear that, but I have all the time in the world to work on, on this sort of stuff. And I pulled it, pulled up, uh, wrote some Python code. The link uh, is on GitHub at, at, the, at the very end of uh, the presentation if you uh, want to waste your time and look at ugly code. Uh, then it pulls some Garrett um, patches and some Stackalytics, Stackalytics uh, stuff and then graphs a bunch of that. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this, what you're looking at, this is the triple O heat templates uh, repo. And these are all of the patches that were ever merged to that repo. So that's, I can't see, but that's 23 something patches. And the uh, X axis is the time. The Y axis is how long did it take uh, to merge the last 60 patches, right? So what is the mean time to merge the last 60 patches? So the Y axis is in days. So just as an example, uh, yeah, that's barely working. But if you look at, um, 
I don't know, February of 2015, then it took 15 days. To, the, the mean time was 15 days to merge uh, over the course of the last 60 patches, right? And what's interesting here, if you look at this graph, is that this looks like an earthquake barometer, right? I mean, this is going up and down like crazy, and the y-axis, this is significant because the y-axis doesn't go between 14 and 16, right? This goes between 5 and 30. So this, the difference between 5 and 30, apart from it being 25, is a lot. I mean, as a developer, if I get my stuff merged in five days, I can, you know, I'm happy, right? I can work. If it's 30 days, then that changes everything because then I have to work on multiple things at the same time because I'm waiting for my stuff to get merged. And it's, 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 it's a different world to live in. So I was asking uh, the current PTL of Triple O, uh, which is this gentleman sitting right here, Emilian, which, uh, who is, uh, uh, he's actually not human, he's actually a saint. And uh, he was talking to me, gave me the time of day, and we were talking about this, and uh, well, what could explain this stuff? So uh, CI, for example, Triple O has historically had uh, issues uh, with CI stability. And there, that means that there could be periods of time where for a couple of weeks there, so two weeks, you're not getting anything merged. So obviously that bumps the mean time, right? So I was thinking, okay, well, this is really interesting stuff to me. And what else can we learn? So uh, what are the different ways of looking at this data? What else, what else can we do? Um, so I was looking at, and the graph is going to get even more horrible, trust me. Uh, I, I wanted to look at March uh, of 2016 because it looks like the time to merge kind of started going down, right? Right. So if I kind of went that away, uh, so that was interesting. And I looked at the volume of incoming patches, right? So the red stuff, the red graph is how many purge, how many patches were um, sent, how many patches were created that day. So the y-axis here is between one and six. And again, that's significant. The variance is between one and six. That means either you're getting one patch a day or you're getting six patches a day. And over the course of a week, that means that the, cores have, uh, the core reviewers of that project have to either review seven patches uh, or 32. And that's a different order of magnitude. That means that your behaviors have to change. Uh, so what's happening is that the incoming volume of patches is going up significantly, and the review time is going down significantly. So what could possibly explain that? So again, I pestered uh, Emilian, and we tried to explain this, and uh, this comes down to governance changes. So what kind of changes could you make in your community to explain this sort of thing? So I thought, okay, well, it would be neat if we could graph the number of cores over time, right? So maybe the number of cores went up, so they were able to review more patches faster. So how do you count cores? Well, uh, Stackalytics is a really interesting, a really useful piece of software for pe you know, people like me that like to spend their time looking at graphs. Uh, and it does historical data, right? So you can go back to a previous release and look at the patches and reviews for that release. Unfortunately, it shows you the current cores. So if you go back to Icehouse, it shows you the cores from today. So how do you count, how do you visualize the number of cores over time? What I ended up doing uh, is I got all of the patches that were ever merged and then I looked at um, how was that, what was the last patch set for that patch. So I go through each person's plus twos, minus twos, and plus A's, so the patch approvals, and I basically just remember that. And then here each line is a person and their actions as a core start at some timeline and end in some other timeline, right? The first patch that they ever approved or gave a plus or, uh, plus or minus two, and the last patch that they ever did that for. And so you get these time periods and you do a, a vertical line, right? For each day you basically cross the line and you can count the number of cores that were active uh, for that uh, period of time. And then you get this obnoxious, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's close to art at this point, I think. It's very colorful. 
And so the green, the blue and the red, it's exactly like before. And the, the new piece of information is the number of cores over time, which is in green. And the y-axis is over at the far right. It's between 4 and 18. And obviously, again, that's a very big variance. Four cores, small project, 18 cores is a monster. So, well, anybody can look at this and say, wow, the number of cores in, from March 2016 shot up dramatically between around 11 cores and 18 cores. Um, and they did something similar to the neutron community where they basically um, maybe de-emphasized the idea of super cores that are expected to know everything there is to know. And uh, cores that specialize in an area or a component like OS net config or these specific components of Triple O. And so uh, the core is expected to kind of stay within his area of expertise and merge or plus two stuff that they actually know anything about. Uh, and it seemed to work. Uh, it seemed to work really significantly and I thought that this was very interesting. And do these governance changes always work? Right, so I spend a lot of my time uh, when I was working on Neutron um, thinking about the community and, and, and you know, is the, is the time to review, the time to merge, is it going up, is it going down? Uh, the number of cores, how we structure our community, uh, especially in Neutron, it, it went through pretty drastic changes. So do governance changes always work? So I looked at Nova. And in Nova, in uh, April of 2014, they introduced, I think it, most likely it was the first project that introduced the specs process. And a bunch of specs started merging around that time. And what did that do to review time? Intuitively, it means that there's another barrier of entry before you can start pushing your patches and having them merged. You first have to go through this other process. So intuitively, this would um, increase the review time, right? It means that you, it takes more, more time for your stuff to merge. Uh, so did it increase or decrease? Oh, seriously, I'm, I'm asking. Did this, did this increase or decrease the time to review? So let's take a look at this beauty of a graph. That this is again the time to review and the number of patches. And interestingly, the number of patches roughly went, is going down, right? It went down to that, to that valley and, and, and roughly speaking, it's going down. And the time to review, what happened there? I'm looking at this and it's kind of, it kind of stayed the same. It's not it, visually, you've got this line over here in the middle and roughly speaking, it kind of stayed the same. Uh, so why? How can we explain that? Again, counterintuitively, the number of cores in Nova is going down, yet the review time is roughly staying the same. How can we explain that? I'm not exactly sure, but I found that really interesting. Um, similar thing happened in Neutron, similar thing uh, that, that, that happened in Triple O, is that roughly uh, from December of 2014 to mid-2015, we did two very dramatic things in the community, which was to split out the load balancing VPN uh, and firewall as a service, as well as all of the Neutron drivers, right? So we basically said, okay, the Neutron repository, instead of being everything networking in OpenStack, now it's just gonna be the Neutron platform, which means the API, quotas, um, uh, the policy stuff, and the reference implementation. So OVS, Linux Bridge, and SRUV, and nothing else, right? So we split out a few hundred, how, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, uh, which to me looking back was a win-win because the vendors uh, could work at their own pace. They weren't bottlenecked by neutron cores, and neutron cores didn't have to pretend to know what it is that they're talking about when they're reviewing stuff that requires hardware that they don't even own. And would that increase or decrease review time? So this, we're looking at just the Neutron repository. Its scope went down drastically, right? And would this increase or decrease review time for the Neutron repository when everything else around it has been split off? Intuitively, I thought that this, this would decrease merge time significantly. Uh, you've got the same number of people roughly working on 
less stuff, less incoming patches. So they should be able to merge the, the neutron stuff faster. So I, I thought, well, you know, we could look at the number of patches first. The number of patches is kind of static or even going down, which I guess kind of makes sense, seeing as, you know, VMware and, and, and Juniper and Cisco and all of the, uh, the, the people doing great work are doing it in separate repositories now. So the number of patches is going down, and review time kind of didn't change. So it's kind of staying the same. And this, to me, was really counterintuitive. It, it, it's also not what I felt uh, in my rotten heart when I was uh, experiencing that myself. I thought that it was much quicker to get my stuff merged, but it uh, wasn't. Um, What's even more interesting is that at exactly the same time, we were iterating very quickly on governance changes, and we introduced the lieutenant system, uh, which is very similar to what Triple O was doing, is that we introduced the idea of mini cores that are supposed to specialize. The number of cores shot up dramatically. It nearly doubled from uh, 13 to 22. Obviously, it's been going down pretty dramatically ever since. Um, but all of these new cores that were responsible for less things uh, we're not actually reviewing faster. And this, this, this graph is weird to me, uh, but there it is. So going back to the argument, right? Uh, the reason why I started doing all of this stuff is because I wanted to, to beat that other colleague of mine into submission and to show him that I am a better person for having won that argument. So I was looking at a number of different metrics um, um, merge time as a function of, right? So looking at lines of code, uh, do intuitive, you don't really need graphs for this, right? But bigger patches are slower to merge. So that's true with a small caveat, is that looking at the Keystone repository, so the x-axis is lines of code, so bigger patches are on the right. And uh, each dot here is not a person, but a patch. These are individual patches from the last year just from the last year in case there were any significant changes. And the y-axis is how many days did it take to merge that patch. Obviously, there is a significant cluster, right? There's a huge cluster of small patches that were very quick to merge. But what was interesting to me is that I expected for there to be a stronger correlation because I expected the graph to go like that, right? So bigger patches take longer to, mer to merge, so it's kind of supposed to have that you know, linear uh, graph. So if there was a strong correlation, you would see the, the kind of a line of, of dots roughly correlating and going up. And it's kind of not like that. I mean, this was also almost looks like it was generated by a num random number generator. Uh, you know, I would question the legitimacy of this graph, but I made it. Uh, so beyond this cluster, it looks like there is absolutely no correlation. So, yeah, I pruned like the, this is the bottom 90%. Uh, so this is the, you know, the vast majority of patches. Uh, and it, you know, just to verify, this is the same in every major uh, project. So I looked at a wide uh, array of, of projects and it looks pretty much the same. Um, there's, our, there's, there's differences, but by the way, uh, Cinder, for example, has generally larger patches than other projects. I don't know why. But there's differently, differently uh, differences. So uh, what I did learn, and this was the most uh, interesting thing for me is, and again, this is intuitive, but only if you've been in the community for a long time and you kind of know how it works, is the difference between uh, new contributors, people that you know merged, uh, the, they pushed their first patch, their second patch, and people that have been there for years, and, and everybody knows them, and they know everybody, and they know who to ping when they need their stuff merged, and they know how it works, and they know how to write the commit message, and they know all of the, the, the written and unwritten uh, rules. Um, so, long-term contribution versus flyby. So, if you graph the time to merge by uh, resolved bugs, right? So this is basically saying the more bugs you solve, on average, the less time it takes to merge your own stuff, 
right? So here each dot is not a patch, but each dot represents a human being. Um, funny way to represent people, but basically saying that this guy on the right resolved, uh, you know, 45 bugs and it took 22 days to, on average to merge uh, his patches. So we do the same thing by bugs resolved, bugs filed, emails, number of patches, and of course the big one, number of reviews. So the more I reviewed, the quicker it is to merge my own patches. And we always knew that to be true, but it's just nice seeing it graphically. So what's interesting is that if you look at different communities, right? So Neutron is categorized by specific practices in its community. Uh, but it works, it works. It doesn't really matter which project you look at. It works if you look at projects like Cola and SFC and Heat. And these are projects that are of different sizes. These are small projects and huge projects and single vendor and, and multi-vendor and uh, different projects and it always works. And you can always see this sort of pattern where there's a huge cluster of uh, 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 people that have not yet generated a lot of work, right? Not yet generated a lot of patches or reviews or bugs or what is it? Or, or, or whatever, and that's the, the people in the red box. That's the dangerous box. You don't want to be in that box because it's nearly randomly generated. I mean, there's a nearly random distribution of the review time. So that means that the first patch that you send and the fifth patch that you send, it can either take two days to merge it and then you're off doing the next thing, or 140 days, which means that you quit. Right? That means that you stop working on OpenStack because why would I want to send patches when it takes half a year to merge my stuff? Well, the good news is that it gets better over time. So you look at the people in the green box. These are people that have their stuff merged on average 20 days or less. That means that you can actually get some work done. And I looked at all of the people by name, all of the people in that box for different communities. And again, this pretty much works globally. Uh, the time to merge for a person drops dramatically in the first year and then kind of stabilizes. Uh, and it's intuitive to people that are in that green box. So I, I, to me, I know that to be true because I experienced it myself and I saw all of my peers go through the same process. It absolutely sucks in the beginning. It's, it's a horrible experience. You send your patch. To file, it's the most important bug in the world and nobody gives you the time of day and your stuff, it doesn't get any attention. But after some time, you learn the practices and more importantly, you get to know the people because you go to the summits, uh, if possible, and you get to know the people and they get to know you and they merge your stuff very, very quickly. Uh, so the <laughs> message is it sucks, but it gets better over time. Uh, there's ways to accelerate this. so. So a couple of notes. First, there's the link to the code if you happen to, uh, to have spare time. Uh, and second of all is that there's a way to accelerate that process. So in the speaker notes, I will upload the slide um, to my website and I'm, I'm assuming also the, the Summit website uh, where there's best practices merged this was written uh, by Neutron community members like uh, Kevin and Rosella, um, where they you know, basically write down what worked for them, what are the best practices, how to, and it, it's silly, but it's, a, it's how to write the commit message, right? That matters a whole lot because you can spend days ping-ponging on the, the whatever. Uh, and you know, showing up on IRC and all of these uh, best practices that, that make a huge difference. Um, that's what I've got to say. Any questions? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so one of the best practices that we often hear about in the Nova community is that new contributors should try and do their own reviewing with a particular level of kind of concentration on the patches that are submitted by cores. So that's the best way to make yourself kind of known to the cores is to review their patches and hopefully find issues in their patches and identify nits and prove your kind of technical um, chops in that way. 
So yeah, I'm wondering if that's something that we could apply some statistical analysis to. I'm, so first off, that's what I tell people when I mentor them, um, is to piss off cores, basically. Uh, don't, it just get any emotional reaction from a core and they'll remember you for good or for bad. Um, yeah, it should be possible to graph it, absolutely. I, uh, I can't say that I will do it, but it's, it's obviously absolutely possible, yeah. Hey, um, what, what kind of things do you think uh, the OpenStack community can do to uh, onboard more quickly the new developers in the community? And because this is an ongoing topic we have uh, at the TC, and and we have been discussing about some ways to, um, you know, make some YouTube videos of how you can do code review, how you can learn more about how being involved. So. What, what kind of things you think we should focus more on the next months, maybe? So when I started, I remember there was not a lot of stuff. There were not a lot of blog posts three, four years ago, uh, videos. I didn't have any content. Now I think there is actually an abundance. There's too much content. So when I onboard people, I prepare a list of things that you have to read in a specific order, just because there's too much stuff and people get lost. Um, I, I imagine. My, I, I would suspect that there's like five different onboarding documents at this point in different locations. So if we could have one, that'd be a good start. And specifically about learning how to review, because it took me years to learn how to review uh, properly. When I reviewed at the start, it was uh, a contest to see how many uh, comments I could leave, right? So, you know, Owen, you have a, a patch and I'm trying to find all of the different problems with the patch, which is not helpful at all, uh, it's not the philosophy mentality which I think people should review. And then I, it took me years, but I slowly transitioned to a style where I imagine that the patch author is sitting next to me and we are just going through the patch together trying to, mer to merge the best possible version of the patch. And I think that mentality shift uh, helps because uh, a lot of people try just to find as many nits as possible to prove that they are the best reviewer in the world. Uh, so I don't know if we have, do we have a global um, onboarding document for OpenStack developers across all of the different projects? We, yeah, it's, it's very technical. Uh, it's like Git, how to. So, yeah, that. Yeah, th there's things that are, you learn by experience and you don't necessarily have to, like the review best practices. I think they are written down. I, I'm, I'm sure that they can be improved for the, the soft, you know, soft skills uh, involved because it's not a technical process. It's just two people talking. Uh, and that's super, much harder than, you know, fixing a bug. I hope that's anywhere near an answer. <laughs> Yeah, do you think maybe <clears throat> the foundation could have some videos maybe on YouTube or something where like we ask uh, the community leaders to like PTLs, core reviewers and reviewers just to share the best practices on how do they make review on individ individual projects and maybe share it on through videos or something like more like formal, you know. W would you think that that will help, so I'm asking you because we, we are both at the TC, so that's something we are working on, so. Um, yeah, I, I think that was one of the things that we identified with the, um, when we had our leadership summit uh, between the board UC and TC a couple of months ago. Um, we, we were trying to figure out how to grow leadership within the community, which kind of piggybacks on being able to bring people into the community in the first place and get them kind of to the point that SF is talking about, um, you know, that, that year in where, where they're, they're feeling comfortable with their ability to get changes merged, to review code uh, well, and um, similar sorts of things that also allow them to be good leaders within the community. Um, we did identify that, that we want the foundation to, um, 
to, to basically, uh, among other things, try to curate uh, some of the video sessions, such as this one, um, but others uh, that, that kind of outline the sorts of behaviors that, uh, that can make someone um, more effective uh, as a contributor within the community, as a leader within the community. Um, so we're, we're doing some very targeted ones, like Amelian's gonna kind of do uh, some, a, a brief lightning session of some code review tomorrow afternoon, I think. Um, but you know, also just more generally, sessions like these come up spontaneously um, at, at each conference that, uh, that we put together. So trying to collect those and, and sort of curate uh, the, the, the topics that they cover is uh, something we're gonna try to focus on. Cool. There's also there, there's already you know material written that I mentioned earlier that I, I thought that was really spot on uh, by Kevin and Rosella and there's some uh, links somewhere. Here. Hey. Hi. Um, so two things. Um, one is. Um, I guess by way of a concrete suggestion, um, when we displayed that welcome new contributor message on people's first review, maybe we can give them a really short and easy to read, you know, handful of links like, you know, how and why do we review on these projects? And, um, you know, what are people actually going to be looking for in those contributions? And um, I guess the other thing is, I think we need to kind of be more aware of the fact that a, a lot of contributors that we're gonna have are not, they're not people who are habituated to being in an open source environment. They, so they really have to start from square one in terms of, you know, how does this work? What is this community thing? Like if I'm, if I'm sitting at Dollar Big Corp and I'm working on some downstream OpenStack distribution, say, and um, you know, my manager is telling me, okay, you need to submit this upstream so we don't have to maintain this separate thing going forward, you know, like, and I come into that and then all of a sudden people are firing all of these questions at me, some of which are maybe not so kind of helpful or polite or friendly. Awesome. It's gonna be a really overwhelming experience. And I, I feel like, um, you know, folks who are more invested in the community don't have that kind of perspective on what that experience is like. I actually cheated and looked at your slides ahead of time because I think you had them on your blog. And um, yeah, I think this is a really interesting area. I think one other thing is it would be really interesting to talk to people who did give up and, and ask them, you know, why, why didn't you contribute? I mean, obviously they're not necessarily gonna wanna come back and answer those questions if they, if they quit, but it would, be, it would be interesting to see like, you know, was it just, you just had that one bug and now you're good or you know, were you put off by the amount of time or people's attitudes or whatever? So, yeah, yeah. yeah not exactly a question, but just some stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, being realistic, there's people that are paid to work on a project continuously through years and they can afford to, to spend that time and there's people that aren't that are basically being told by their manager, go fix these two bugs that are important for our you know, product or what have not. And that is very valuable that these, these bugs are upstream, but these people just, they don't have the option of you know, working full time on, on the project. Um, unfortunately, they are in the red box. I don't have. <laughs> they are, and um, the other thing is a lot of the help that we can give them is is through IRC or through other means that they might not even really be aware that they can have access to or that it might be difficult for them to access. A lot of, a lot of something that I notice is a lot of people don't go on IRC. Yeah, they don't. A lot of folks who are kind of working on the, on the you know, kind of downstream let's fix stuff for the customer side are, are not on IRC. And, 
a lot of them are not even Linux desktop users gasp. <laughs> One of the things um, in terms of just dealing it periodically, because I'm, I'm not 100% upstream, and so that's one of the challenges of IRC is actually like, you know, if I have to go back and, and scroll through or figure out what people have been saying over the last like two days while I was working on something else, it's really tricky. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to say was if you have somebody that has one particular problem and they basically throw a patch over the wall and run away, um, I've worked in other communities, notably the, the Linux kernel, where they're far more accepting of that, and somebody will take that and fix it up and get it merged. Whereas it seems to me that in OpenStack, we're not very good at somebody else taking that and running with it. It just kind of tends to sit there and languish. So, so one, just to jump in, one dirty little secret about um, the welcome new contributor message that uh, Cinerama had mentioned. Um, it was implemented not just to, um, to welcome new contributors, but also to give reviewers on those projects an indication that this is someone's first patch and to be gentle <laughs> and to kind of help try to usher and guide them. Because, I mean, we get so many new patches from, from people that it, it's kind of hard to keep track of, you know, this is a name I've never seen before. Um, so when you see that message show up in a, in a, in a a change that's been submitted, you kind of know, you know, this this is someone who we may need to treat with kid gloves initially, and kind of help usher them into the the community a little uh, more gently. Hi, thanks for the statistics. Mm -hmm. Did you also try to correlate the uh, review time of the patches to outside events like Christmas, vacations, OpenStack summits, uh, and the various? other time points per project. For example, uh, there are milestones. milestones Everybody yeah. tries to get the patch in before a milestone, which means there are many more patches before that that can't be reviewed or might be reviewed and similar things. I would believe that this should amount to at least half of the variance of all the data. Yeah, I mean, we have the, the review time here uh, for various projects. Um, my experience is, is exactly that. I mean, I remember there was a summit that I didn't go to and I had nobody to work with. I mean, there was no reason to send a patch because nobody would review it. Uh, same for Christmas. Uh, so yeah, that, that is, to me, that's very intuitive. Uh, you know, we could look at December's here to try to, to see anything. <clears throat> Uh, th there's just so many variables, so many reasons why you know this graph would go up and down. It's it's uh, feature freeze. Yeah, milestones, yeah. feature freeze. Yeah. Obviously, in Neutron, I remember uh, you know work, working weekends before uh, uh, feature freeze. Absolutely. Do you have some raw data available on the GitHub repo? Or um, could you post it? For example, start of patch when it got merged and similar stuff. Um, well, yeah, I mean, certainly you can look at the, the code, all of the code to, to generate these graphs are here on GitHub, and you can just see, you know, what sort of Garrett queries I did and how I aggregated uh, the data, and then you can do anything. Okay, thanks very much. Well, if you soften out some of that variance, though, with your moving average. What's that? You would soften out some of that variance, you know, week to week variance with the moving average to make one of your. That, that, that's what this is, essentially. Exactly. This is a moving uh, mean. Yep. So it's a moving mean of every day or something to be fair. That would kind of, I mean, Christmas is a week. You know, it would soften it out a bit. The, the yeah, obviously looking at the Nova graph, this is with smoothing. Right. So looking at this without smoothing would be nearly meaningless. Yeah. But yeah, uh, obviously if th this is a mean of the last, uh, 60 patches and you know we send this many patches a week then yeah so Christmas for example is kind of averaged out. Yep. So I want to mention something that's kind of been implicitly kind of danced around uh, which is that you, there's no way of not starting in the red box. We're not talking about mentoring people so they can jump right into the green box. That's not going to happen not ever. We're trying to basically, you know, increase the slope of their 
of their graph so that they go from the red box to the green box a little bit quicker and maybe you know, your next set of slides will be based on what training materials they consulted, what is the slope of their graph. Uh, that, that would be nearly impossible to come up with, but I you can, can interview every single person. What's that? Yeah, I can every, every, every interview every, every single contributor. Right. Uh, but, but I mean, the point is you have to, some of this stuff, I mean, you just can't grok or glean by reading a blog or having somebody tell you, you have to get in there into the mud and the muck and the mire and just get the experience. And I'm not saying, I'm not in the green box and I'm, I'm still wading my way through the left-hand side of this graph. And, but I mean, I can see, I've, I've, I've been in it enough that I can see like what, what's, what's going on and what needs to happen. So, you know, I just, I guess I just wanted to make that point. You can't get you can't avoid the red box. Yeah, it's, you can accelerate the process, but you have to go through it. Yeah. It takes a, a non-zero amount of time. Right. To add on to that, the notion in positive psychology is they don't want to look at, they want to look at people that are the outliers. They're the ones that went fast from being in the red box to being in the green box. Is there a way for cores to identify those sort of people and figure out what they did in a way to replicate that? Yeah, I have a couple of, I, I, you know. I imagine that happens, and, and it, may not, it may just be a very skilled person or the mythical 10x. Um, but, yeah. um, but it seems like uh, potentially another way of getting at a little bit of what, uh, what he's talking about. Yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of ran through these graphs for different colleagues of mine, and absolutely there's people that kind of just kind of started effective and, and stayed effective throughout their uh, career. So uh, another way to maybe phrase that is um, why don't we interview those people and see what's their secret? And I'm also over time. So thank you.